This is Do It For A Living, your source for inside information on the future of automotive performance. Treat people right, uh, even when it costs you something. That's okay. It's it's business. But I'm always looking for a better design, uh, improved methods of manufacturing, a new challenge. You know, and I think that's really led to our success. Is is just looking at everything as a challenge. Hey, how can you make it better? What's holding you back from starting or growing your business into what it can be? Well, if you're listening to this, it's not a lack of information. What you're about to hear is all you need to get motivated and start making waves. Do It For A Living podcast details the journey of today's true players in their own words. Find out how they broke out so you can too. The time is now. The time is always now. Welcome back to another episode of Do It For A Living. I'm Kevin Dubois. Uh, this week, we've got Dirk Starkson of ACT Clutch. Um, I've met Dirk in person um, after kind of a uh, oddball situation where uh, I was, uh, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, blacklisted for selling parts under uh, the, um, I guess the EPP, is that what you call it, EPP? The UPP. UPP, yeah. UPP pricing yeah. list. And, uh, yeah. I Shame post- on you. Yeah, yeah, I posted it on Facebook, the letter I received, and I was quite upset about it. And Dirk himself actually came out and visited my shop, and we talked for several hours about it. And uh, it really opened my eyes to... Um, the industry as a whole, and this is kind of really early on when my business was, I guess, struggling along and kind of, I guess, figuring out the ropes, I guess you could say. Um, but now I've, uh, I'm have a strong proponent of this stuff because it actually allows us to uh, make money in the industry rather than just giving everything away. So, um, Dirk, how are you doing today? Uh, great. Cool. I, I really want to thank you for taking some time to uh, talk to us and kind of share your story. And I know we've got some questions about that exact thing Um later on in the, in the, in the interview. So, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started and why don't you start by telling us your background and like, what's your education? How'd you get involved with cars? You know, bring us up to how you got ACT going. Well, uh, yeah, we, ever since I was a little kid, I, I've always been a, you know, a hands-on guy. My dad's a mechanical engineer. He showed me how to operate his electric hand drill at the age of 10. And I was the kid on the block that would, um, I'd drill out every all the other kids' sissy bars to lower their seat on their on their uh, bike, you know, which was cool back then. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, in junior high, I uh, enrolled in a metal shop class, and I just and I would get through all my projects as fast as I could, so I could uh, design and make my own monoshock bike frame, which I, which is pretty cool for a kid who didn't have any machine shop or anything, you know. But uh, mm-hmm. it didn't turn out so well at the time, but. But it was it was fun. I always wanted to do you know something custom. You know, later on I got into dirt bikes and dune buggies. Uh, I built a couple dune buggies and whatnot. I had a Baja bug that I never finished, but <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> uh, I had a, I actually owned a Carmen Ghia because back then you know this is the '70s, so okay. so the, uh, so this is the VW craze, and I owned a Carmen Ghia with a Buick V6 behind it. Okay. And uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I uh, got in some trouble with that, you know, of course. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I don't know. I was always that guy that I had just as much fun under the car as I did behind the wheel. You know, that, that's mm-hmm. just me. Um, you know, so I started uh, working for a, a clutch company uh, called uh, Kennedy Engineered Products. They built engine adapters. That's where the Buick V6 adapter came from. And, and they made Volkswagen clutches. And they're they're still to this day the uh, like the, the name in uh, VW clutches for the, like the old air cools and stuff. Okay. So on that Carmen Ghia, did you do that swap yourself or is that something you just bought? Um, well, actually, it was a customer of Kennedy's that uh, he never finished it. Okay. Um, so I got the car cheap with the motor hanging off the back of it with a Kennedy adapter, and and so we got it running, and and uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's kind of weird though, because it is a uh, 1965. So back in '65, they had the little skinny drum brakes in the back, and and a little bit wider drum brakes in the front. <laughs> I mean, oh boy, this thing, uh, you 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 steer more with the throttle, I think, than you you do with the steering wheel. All the body roll and tire tire yeah, squish. <laughs> yeah, and it was swing axle, you know. So, so you you get out if you uh, 
get off the throttle, the back end comes up, the tires tuck in, and the thing, you know, yeah, wants to come around on you. And as soon as you're pointing in the right direction, you plant the throttle and it goes straight because <laughs> the front end will float. <laughs> so um, to give you a kind of a timeline of uh, how I stopped, started my business, uh, well, I, I guess I'll go back, you know, in 79 – I was a clutch assembler okay. for Kennedy Engineered Products and or KEP. Uh, I was pursuing college at that time, going to go for a mechanical engineering degree, and uh, I was working my way up uh, at that uh, through Kennedy as a machinist, then an engineer. I kind of started off as a draftsman, I guess. Um, uh, then, then I finally became general manager. Actually, I was I was with him for uh, 14 years before starting ACT. Uh, the owner, Hobart Kennedy, he's a he's a friend of my dad's. So they okay. went to college together. Um, then in 1992, I started uh, engineering and producing some pressure plates for one of Kennedy's customers. Uh, these were for like Japanese imports because okay. that was when the the whole, uh, import craze started. The Japanese imports started taking off. Okay, and so uh, this. This customer of, of Kennedy sought us out, and then in '94, um, I, I asked uh, Mr. Kennedy. I approached him, "Hey, why don't why don't you let me pursue this and and go after it?" Because he really didn't have much interest in it. Okay. And so I did. And uh, then after some real, and this is all private label manufacturing at that time. I was only making the pressure plates because the the key element of that was the diaphragm spring, and I learned that technology from uh, from Mr. Kennedy. So after some bad experiences with private label, about 1996, I started branding ACT and, and marketing the, the company. Okay. So then, uh, you know, we grew really quickly uh, those first few years. And in 2001, we moved from Palmdale uh, into our current facility in Lancaster. And so when you when you guys were working on, uh, um, or I should say when you were working for Kennedy, and that customer came to Kennedy to get the, the products made and you just happened to be like the engineer or the project manager for that product. Is that how that worked out? Or did uh, they, yep. did they come to you directly? No, it was, it was through Kennedy and okay. he was just trying to search out anybody who knew how to make, uh, make pressure plates for these, for the Japanese imports. Okay. Uh, really the diaphragm spring technology that's that's what sets us apart. It still does to this day, but that's what set us apart back then. Is Mr. Kennedy had uh, had the rudimentary elements of how to design and manufacture diaphragm springs in smaller quantity. Uh, you know the the OE manufacturers. You know they they know how to do it, but they only know how to do it in large quantities. And it's a different process, and then it's quite extensive in, on the engineering side as well. So for a typical clutch rebuilder or or somebody like that, they, they just really don't have the tools they need to, to do the engineering and the manufacturing. And that's where we, where we come in. Okay. And then you, you, you were working on the product and wanted to grow it. Whereas, um, uh, Mr. Kennedy, I guess is his name. He said, we don't really want to work on this product and you can take it off and do it yourself. That's, that's kind of what I took away from that. Right. Well, originally, uh, it was, it was all for him. Mm -hmm. uh, but after a couple of years, I'm realizing, okay, we're putting this customer in the clutch business and I'm doing all the work and Mr. Kennedy really didn't have much interest in it. Okay. So I'm like, well, if you're going to put him in the clutch business and I'm doing all the work, why don't you just put me in the clutch business? And that, that was kind of the premise of, of starting ACT. Okay. Okay. I follow you. So, um, you kind of, you, you're growing the business. Um, do you think of yourself as an entrepreneur? Did you like I mean, you, you obviously wanted to take a hold of this project and run with it. Is that something you set out to do before you even began working for them? Well, by the by the time I started ACT, I was a general manager there. So I've seen a lot of the elements of running a business and uh, the, uh, you know, kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't really consider myself as a uh, an inter entrepreneur. I, I'm more of a gearhead kind of guy. I want to build a better mousetrap. Okay. Yeah, maybe I have the wrong perception of what an entrepreneur is, but but you know, in my mind, I picture somebody who's more of a Type A personality, a risk taker, you know, big uh -huh. picture, take no prisoners kind of person. 
Yeah, I, and, and I'm not like that at all. I'm I'm more methodical. I want to be behind the scenes, not on stage. Even this this interview is kind of weird to me, but yeah, I, that's okay. I'll deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's like I want to be, you know, under the car, not behind the wheel. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, I I do tend to be more of a, a do-it-yourselfer. I use a die-hard do-it-yourselfer, but I, I had to learn really quickly running the business that. Uh, uh, you know, to allow others to use their expertise when I when I didn't have it. You know, so being right. both a do-it-yourselfer and letting go and letting other people do it have, have really served me well over the years, and I think that uh, that's led to our success. Okay, and so when you're when you're, you know, the big struggle for most people is trying to uh, leave a full-time job and do it on their own because obviously you have to you have to earn the money yourself at that point. Is that something that kind of scared you? Did you slowly transition out, or did you just jump into it full steam ahead? Well, I was uh, I was really blessed because I didn't have to quit my full time job. I didn't. I could slowly transition out because I had uh, Mr. Kennedy supporting me on this project. Okay. Um, you know, but I I also wanted to respect him, and I made sure to honor uh, honor him in in doing it. You know, because uh, he's the one who gave me the opportunity to pursue ACT. <clears throat> yeah, I still had my full time job uh, as I was starting off. Mr. Kennedy was, uh, uh, he was very supportive. He, he rented me space and equipment in his own shop to start ACT. Um, I actually insisted on paying him because he, he really didn't need the money and, and didn't care. You know, uh, he wanted to see me succeed. Yeah, he's, in a sense, he, I was like a, like a kid to him, I guess, okay. or I was you know, like a son. He didn't have any, any family. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it, I, I don't know what it's like to take that risk because, uh, you know, I was just really blessed I didn't have to. Well, that's that's really awesome that he's so supportive of it. <laughs> you know, most of the time you hear people saying like, oh, I had an employee for me and he quit to go start his own business and now I hate him. <laughs> right. That's kind of like the usual, uh, the usual, uh, um, I guess, perception of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and here, you know, I've, I've tried to pay that forward, too. We've had a lot of guys come and go at ACT that uh, – have taken on, you know, I mean, they haven't like stole our business and, and competed with us, but, but they've gone and pursue other, other things. And, you know, I've got uh, people that are in, in uh, civil service doing, you know, like firefighters and police guys. I've got a guy working as a CPA somewhere and, you know, uh, and, and, uh, you know, I've always, you know, tried to ha uh, take that same mindset that Mr. Kennedy did with, with me to, to help help prepare these guys to, to go on because I can't keep everybody. You <laughs> right, know, I think right. it's it's really short minded to if, if you're gonna look at it that way, you know, oh, you can't go. I'm gonna sabotage you from your success so you so you have to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen some companies do that. It's it's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and how has location played a role in your success? We're really fortunate because at the same time A C T was beginning, you know, that that was in the nineties. So you've got the import drag racing Scene that's really taking off in Southern California. You know, they're finally getting off the streets and stop street racing and going out to, you know, LACR, which is right in our backyard in Palmdale. Uh, you know, and then they started organizing events. You know, you had the NHRA track in Pomona also having events for Sport Compact. But back then it was import drag racing, not Sport Compact. But mm -hmm. hey, you got to include the domestic brands. <laughs> <laughs> right. So anyway, uh, ACT, uh, you know, we, we started off, you know, going to, like all of Frank Choi's Battle of the Imports and the IDRC events, they were really popular. They actually they had to turn people away at that time. And of course, then the NHRA and NOPE and others had their own series, you know, so we were right, right in the, in the midst of that. And you had, you know, you had guys that needed clutches. I mean, shoot, you know, but the, but being in Southern California really helped us because okay. we were, we were really close. And, if you guys are, you know, I mean, you, you really hit the, I guess, the uh, perfect time to grow the business when everything was starting to explode in the import stuff. But uh, have you ever really doubted yourself and wondered if this isn't going to work? And, and how do you overcome that feeling and move forward? Well, like I said, I tend to be methodical and, and uh, you know, I, I make calculated steps and, and calculated risks, really. Uh, probably more so now than I have before. But, uh, but I mean, there's always going to be doubts. But... But that's okay. You know, they're going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I, I've learned to trust my gut and probably more now than, uh, than I ever thought. You know, I, I've, there have been times when I really couldn't explain why 
I had to say no to something. Let's say, hey, this is a great deal, you know, and and it just didn't feel right. And my gut has has really served me well. Um, yeah, I concentrate on you know what's the right thing to do, you know, because it, it leaves less room for doubt. Mm-hmm. You know, what what's the right way to treat your customer? What's the right way to treat your your um, your employee or a vendor, you know, you honor your contracts. You don't, you know, and, and you treat people right. You know, and sometimes it costs, but that's okay. You know, that's, that's part of doing business too. But I guess, you know, fail, failure doesn't scare me. Um, I, disappointment, if I'm disappointing somebody, that scares me more than failure does. At the risk of sounding a little uh, philosophical, you know, we, we learn a lot through failure. So, mm-hmm. so you need to risk failure if you want to gain success. And, and uh, so, I mean, you know, you, I'm not inspirational speaker or anything like that, but, you know, they, they talk about this a lot, you know, I've yep. heard, heard different people talk about it, but, but yeah, you have to, you know, don't look at it as failure, right? You're learning, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I fail every day. <laughs> yeah. Fail, fail forward. <laughs> okay. Not backward. And what's the worst experience you've had in business? Hmm. Well, that's, that's hard to say. Um, you know, let's see, it's been 20, it's been a lot of years. See, I'm old now. I can't remember how many years it's been. Uh, <laughs> there've been, uh, been many bad experiences that have cost me sleepless nights over the years. Uh, just a couple yeah, in, in 2006 without warning, Exidy, who supplied us with the OE clutches that we would modify, they decided they weren't gonna they were gonna uh, stop selling to ACT, presumably because they saw us as too much of a threat to their performance business. But that's not the that's not what they would tell us. But mm-hmm. but anyway, all all at once they they closed our account. Uh, on top of that, then then they were telling the distributors that they couldn't sell to ACT, oh. and so that that caused us to have to. You know, redesign a bunch of our products and resource some of their products through other sources. And yeah, it was a lot of work. Uh, but I don't know if that would be the worst experience. Probably, probably the crash in the, of the economy in 2008. That was the hardest. Uh, we were having a tremendous year uh, that year, uh, making a lot of money, spending a lot of money, mm-hmm. and experiencing about a 25% increase in sales for the first half of the year. So that's that's how good it was going. Then all of a sudden, sales stopped, and uh, well, not stopped, but it slowed way down. And we had all this raw material coming in that <laughs> that we had, you know, all these stock clutches that we would tear apart, and modify, and stuff, and flywheels and stuff. They're they're coming in that we um, that we you know we wanted to honor those those purchases, of course. But our inventory just, you know, went through the roof, and it took a while to to manage that and get it back in check. And of course, uh, that that causes a big cash crunch. And banks are no help because they're having their own trouble with with the loans and all the other stuff. Banks weren't loaning to anybody at that time. Yeah, but both those experiences with Exidy and with the economy tank tanking and stuff, uh, you know, through both of those, you know, ACT has learned, and I've learned. Uh, quite a bit. I've grown stronger, you know. So in that sense, yeah, I don't think I'd change anything. Uh, obviously, hindsight's twenty twenty, you know. But uh, and there, there are landmines we could have avoided, uh, but uh, but we learned a lot, and and we're a better company because of it. Yeah, and that's a, it, what's cool is uh, I think your 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 situation of making it through two thousand eight. You know, it's very hard, and and I think a lot of other guests that we've had on here kind of echo the same sentiment that. You know, it was super hard and you learned a whole bunch and everybody would have done something maybe a little bit different, but they're all glad they made it through. And, yeah, you know, it's, you know, like it wasn't just you that had a problem. It was everybody. So, <laughs> yeah. And actually, um, you know, what, where the banks weren't help, you know, you know who came to help me, uh, who uh, came to the rescue was Mr. Kennedy. Really? I actually uh, was able to borrow some money from him. So, you know, had I burn my bridge with him and not treat him right i probably couldn't have done that and who knows maybe i wouldn't be around you know that or act wouldn't be around because uh you know he's he's the only one who had the cash and the the faith in me at that time to, <laughs> to uh, keep it going to help me get through it you know I, i'm sure we would have figured out a way but but really that that helped us keep our momentum and move forward okay so the very least we kind of talked about the worst parts of business here what's something you're doing right now that has you fired up Wow. Well, that's uh, that's kind of complicated for me. 
you know, my life, uh, you know, personally is going so many different directions right now. Uh, I mean, and I'm excited and challenged by all of it, you know, in a, in a nutshell, what fires me up is building a better mousetrap. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to constantly improve uh, in advance, whether it's in product design or business practices or personal goals. You know, it's not simply about making money. Uh, that that bores me in a sense. You know, I want to do something different. And, and a lot of times that costs money. So in that sense, I, I might be more su uh, successful if I just would focus on that. But I won't. I always want to change. I want to. I want to push forward. Uh, you know, and <clears throat> at uh, at ACT, we're always working on new applications and innovative designs. Uh, in my own vehicle, we just completed testing a, a clutch for the later Jeep Wrangler. I've got a 2015 uh, Rubicon. <clears throat> of course, we live out in the desert, so hey, perfect place for <laughs> it. Um, we're finished up a total redesign of our domestic twin uh, using a forged aluminum cover, um, but we're also expanding our our European line. Uh, so a lot lot more offerings for the European cars because we've kind of ignored that that market partially because uh, Kennedy delves in a lot of that, and I didn't really want to compete with him. Okay. You know, but now now we're seeing a lot of opportunity there as well. Um, and we're actually working on uh, the twin disc for some of the heavy hitters that you'll like this, you know, like for the Evo, the mm -hmm. WRX and and others like that. Uh, the delay on that project has primarily been because I'm, I'm stubborn. You know, I, I don't, <laughs> don't want to compromise on that design. There's The ones I see on there have too many compromises and uh, we just, we want to get it right. Yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you why you, you've never <clears throat> never done twin discs for Evos, but I guess that kind of answers that, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you'll like it when we do, though. Um, aside from ACT, though, I've, I've also been tasked with the responsibility of being trustee for my good friend and my former employer, Hobart Kennedy. Okay. Uh, he's now suffering from dementia. Oh, okay. So he's not able to, to run his business and handle his own affairs anymore. Uh, so I watch over his 50-year-old business and uh, you know that's that's what started me off of course as i said in thir 39 years ago you know but i'm excited with, for the changes we're making there so that's another thing i'm fired up about um you know, on the personal side you know I've, I've i've got a lot to be excited there too i've got a, a supportive wife and four great kids you know i've got two grandkids now mm -hmm. You know, and keeping a balance is important, you know, so I, I don't want to just be excited about what I'm doing at ACT, you know, it's, and, and I think, I don't know if that's just me or what, but, you know, I, I want to be challenged and, you know, wherever I get involved. Very cool. So I'm curious if, if you're, uh, if you're helping out Mr. Kennedy, and I'm sorry to hear that he's uh, suffering from dementia. My, my grandpa also had the same problem before he passed, oh, but uh, um, so tough. does he have family as well, or is it just himself? Um, he has uh, he has three nieces, uh, and one of the one of the nieces is actually his conservator, so she handles uh, conservator of the person, so she she makes sure he's cared for. Okay, and I handle the estate side of it, so I I oversee his business and his finances, his taxes and insurance, all that kind of stuff. Okay, that's a, that's a I mean I've never heard of. Of, of the business being handed off or, or I guess uh, cared for by somebody else, especially when you could almost potentially be cus or uh, competitors, I guess. I mean, you're friends and obviously you had a good relationship, but it's kind of a, it's an interesting situation, huh? It is. It is. And and it's important to me and, well, it's important to everybody that, that you know, we, that we respect his business and, <laughs> and that, uh, uh, you know, just just we do it right. Like mm -hmm. I said, uh, you know, for me, it's it's about doing it right, and so uh, you know, I, which that's what I like about what I, my my role there is. I, you know, there's so many things I could see in improvement, uh, you know, things like we can improve on, and uh, we're able to work on those things. Very cool. uh, when when he was there and he's starting to starting to slip, you know, and he his business was was not thriving. Okay. And and now it now it is so so it's good, very cool. Okay, so let's uh, take a second and pause and uh, share a word from our sponsors. We all know owning a shop is difficult, so we created My Shop Assist to help you manage the various jobs. Whether you run a machine shop, a performance tuning shop, build off-road trucks, or even do powder coating, My Shop Assist can help you. 
It is completely online and will help you schedule the jobs, log time on each task, track parts orders, and take pictures of the work. You can even export your jobs from My Shop Assist into QuickBooks as invoices. So if you're interested to improve operations at your shop, check out myshopassist.com to start your 30-day free trial. We're back here uh, talking to Dirk from uh, ACT Clutch. Um, so Dirk, how big is your facility and do you rent it or do you own it? Uh, we're currently renting a 20,000 square foot, 22,000 square foot uh, manufacturing facility in Lancaster. Uh, we are in negotiations with the owners to to see if they'll part with it so we can we can purchase the building because we we really like the facility. Um, but uh, yeah, currently we're we're renting. Okay. And have you guys ever written a formal business plan? Well, when I started ACT, I. Yeah, I purchased this organizer. I forget where I got it off, like Costco or something, that was to start a business, okay. you know, how to develop a business plan. And, and that was to help me walk through a business plan. It all seemed just so formal and, and really unnecessary to me, I guess. Uh, it, it did help me identify the order of some of the things that needed to happen, like when, when do you file a fictitious name and open up a company bank account and in what order you do these things, get a business license, all that. Uh, then I met with a group from the Small Business Administration that that they uh, the local Chamber of Commerce put this thing together where they would advise businesses uh, within the the community to he to help them. So anyway, they asked to see my business plan, and I and I and I told them my plan. I said, okay, yeah, I want to do this and that. I've already got these customers, and and you know I've got a place to to start. And uh, here's my plan. And they said, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> they tried to convince me, yeah, it's doomed to failure. It's not going to work. Now, mind you, yeah, I had already been managing a, uh, KEP for a few years prior to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I took their advice and I did what any sensible person would do. I totally ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's how I started. But yeah, I, I didn't really have a, a, you know, a formal business plan. Not that I would, you know, uh, recommend people don't, but but for me it, it wasn't important because in my head, you know, and from my experience and stuff, I I pretty much had the plan. Okay, and you guys are a bigger operation now. Has that changed at all? I'm trying to think how to answer that. Yeah, it's changed quite a bit. I I have a, a management team of of uh, seven people that that we get together and, and talk. Okay. You know, about our plans for the future and and budgeting and about you know what our our next goals are and. And things are more measured than they than they were before, of course. Okay. And how many employees do you have? Uh, right now, we're at about forty. Um, you know, we've uh, uh, we fought really hard to you know to maintain a, a very positive culture for them. You know, because back in the day when we had ten or five or whatever, it, it you know was totally different because. Everybody was doing everything. You know, it wasn't very organized. Uh, so now, now with uh, forty employees, obviously we had to get organized. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so what we did is we uh, now it's all arranged in different departments. No more than five people reporting to to a lead or supervisor. Uh, when we were growing really fast, we anticipated more growth. This is about like two thousand two when we just got in the in the building here. And you know, we thought when we moved into the building, wow, this place is huge. What are we going to do with all this space? Yeah, that didn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we hired uh, management consultants to come in, okay. and they they helped us break some of the old habits and and organize the company for the future. Uh, it was really helpful, but it was also very painful. Not to mention expensive. Yeah, I don't know if you've heard how management consultants work, but uh, but it's very high pressure because you know they want to. They need to get you off of the, off those old habits and that point of stasis and get you off balance, off kilter. So, so it is uncomfortable. You know, change is not comfortable. But if without having that that discomfort, though, you just settle back into where you were. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, in one sense, it was good because I could blame them for the change. I wouldn't, you know, instead of uh, trying to do it myself when, and I have my own bad habits. You know, I could blame them for the change. And so that that helped us to to move forward quite a bit. Um, I don't know if I'd recommend that experience, but but it did help. Um, having good systems, uh, it, it really keeps people on task. But but then 
again, being like family, which we fought to do, it you know, keeps people motivated. Mm -hmm. You know, and you need both. You, you and and that balance between you know really having the expectations of people and and having that having just that that good environment. You, know, it, it's a balance that we want to keep. You know. Yeah, I mean, everybody benefits at the business if uh, if if you have systems in place to stay profitable and and keep the thing rolling, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And uh, how many hours a week do you think you are working? And uh, you obviously have a family and, you know, through the years that the family changed the number of hours you can, you, you're able to work or how does that, how does that all worked out for you? I think when I was younger, I had, I had more energy. I don't think, I think there were more hours in the day back then or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to come in really early and, uh, and work long hours at, uh, primarily in the mornings. I'm more of a morning person. Uh, and now I typically work 40 to 50 hours a week, you know, so okay. not, nothing too, too crazy, mm -hmm. at least with, with ACT. Obviously I've got, you know, my role is split between Kennedy stuff and mine here and, you know, so it gets complicated, but, okay. uh, you know, I've got four kids, they're all grown. Uh, when they, but when the kids are young, yeah, you know, I had to, like I said, I had to come in really early and, and work, work those long hours. Sometimes I bring home, uh, gosh, I remember breaking down clutches in my living room. I have, I'd have my kids taking clutches apart. <laughs> <laughs> it was, and, and I think they remember that. Um, but, uh, but I've always tried to, to maintain that balance, uh, with, with the family. You know, I don't want to, I, I don't, I don't want them to, uh, to resent the business, you know, and, and those long hours, you know, so if I had to lose sleep to do that, that's, that's what we do. Okay. And uh, yeah. you, you touched on it already a little bit, um, but what are your primary tools for managing the business? You said you had a management team and your, uh, your, the, I guess the consultants came in and kind of put some systems in place, but what, what are you doing exactly? Uh, well, I, I, more now than ever before, we, we rely a lot on reporting from our computer software. Okay. Um, we're fortunate. I, I've got a guy, his name's Scott and he handles my IT stuff and he's just amazing. So uh you know and to keep things running smooth whether it's the the server room or it's uh you know connecting the headset on this interview <laughs> i had to get scott's help you know but uh you know he also helps map the aces and pies data for our website uh -huh. creating custom reporting from from a software so that uh, we can manage the production and and manage the uh the inventory sales financing the budgeting all that kind of stuff it's all done done through the software um you know it's it's that old saying right what what gets measured gets done you know so we try to measure our success or or our failure really and and say okay what can what can we learn from this how can we improve you know and that way we find out hey are are we are we on track you know mm -hmm. And and so is that software that you get to using? Is that proprietary or is that like a off the shelf sort of piece of software? Uh, it's it's off the shelf. Um, the, we've had to add different modules and all that kind of stuff, you know, okay. to get more and more out of it. And even then, you know, it, it has some limitations with the with the production side, has some limitations on the reporting side. So we've had to customize it. We've gone to third party uh, providers to they have. Uh, modules they've had or, to enhance yeah. it okay uh so okay and then okay so let's talk about your sales uh like the model that you guys for use for sales so i personally have purchased from you guys um through wholesalers um a lot in the past and then when i was blacklisted then i didn't buy anything uh, for obvious reasons and <laughs> now i'm back on board with using pretty much your clutches uh, other than like the twin disc like the race cars like the real um, super strong stuff. I still use your guys' product for everything underneath that. Don't uh, worry, we'll fix that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what are do you guys do direct to shop at all, or direct to consumer, or wholesale? How do you guys handle your sales? Uh, we do sell through through all the channels, really, uh, but we're primarily geared to selling to the warehouse distributors because they'll have it on the shelf. They're local. Uh, you know, clutches are not easy to to ship. They're heavy mm -hmm. items. Uh, so you want to have it where it's close by, and that makes up about seventy-five percent of our business, maybe a little bit more even. Okay. Um, we do actively engage with the consumer you know, with live chat, email, yep. social media, 
you know, we want to keep our finger on the pulse of, of where they're at. You know, I think we've lost touch with that in the past at times. So when, when the distributor's doing all the sales and all that, and we're not, you know, we're not, uh, and, you know, we want to hear from the customer, you know, and, and we miss that from back in the early days when we were at the racetrack all the time. Okay. And you got, you know, back in the early days, we had guys that were, you know, you got a, I don't know, a Honda and all of a sudden it's making twice as much power, three times as much power. <laughs> yeah. They need a new design, a new mm -hmm. clutch. That was fun, you know. So, so anyway, yeah, we uh, we're actively trying to, to to keep up with the pulse of, of what the what's going on in the industry. Okay. And then uh, at the beginning of the interview here, I talked about the UPP that uh, you know, like at, at first it hurt me, but now it has you know the lessons learned has helped me dramatically. But uh, when when we had that conversation years ago, um, I mean, you you point blank said it it it's hurting your sales because you were cutting off like big volume sellers because they were selling the product below what anybody could make any money on. And how has that played out over the years? Well, as, as you know, firsthand, you know, we've had a very strict policy with our, our unilateral pricing policy or UPP. Yeah, you know, we've refined it over the years uh, and it's been very successful. The, um, honestly, we probably would have sold more clutches without it, but you know, like in, in the first, year our sales went down about ten and a half percent and we had to put some of our largest distributors uh, on the do not sell list because either they were uh, violating the policy by selling below the the price or in most cases with the distributors they were selling to somebody who was on the do, do not sell list and we had to had to clamp down on that because if they can't take it serious then uh, then it's going to fail so this led to some really very uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> I'd say, you know, the one I had with you, uh, yeah, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> you know, I remember I called you up on the way over there. Yeah, you, um, you had a, one of your kids was in college around here or something. Yeah, what he was out on. at uh, Letourneau University out in East Texas mm -hmm. and driving through. I said, hey, I'm going to come by in an hour. You can yell at me personally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, but we didn't we didn't start the policy just to sell more clutches. You know, if the, if the goal was to sell as many clutches as possible, maybe maybe we wouldn't do the policy. You know, we but we we want our customers to be successful, and 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 our customers, being the distributors and and the and the shops, we're struggling to do that. You know, the good news now is that there isn't that ambiguity trying to sell ACT like there was before. You know, it's like, gee, what do I need to sell it at? Well, I'll just sell it cheaper than everybody else. Well, that that doesn't lead to uh, too much profit, you know, you, then you have to try and make it up somewhere else. Yep. So like, you know, before our policy, um, that, you know, that was the mindset people had, you know, because we had a popular brand, they, uh, they felt like the, the only way to compete is with the lowest price. And of course, with the internet and everything, you just look for the lowest price. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, there's always somebody willing to sell cheaper. And uh, we would get all, we would get calls all the time from our distributors saying, hey, you know, we need more margin. You know, you need to sell it cheaper to us. And we, we didn't have room to do that. And meanwhile, the distributors were selling to, to shops that were, let's say, e-tailers that they would move quite a bit of volume, but uh, the, the distributor didn't want to lose, lose the business from those guys. So they would drop their price cheaper than what we would sell it to the e-tailer for. And so then distributor's not making any money. The e-teller, he's, he's selling it cheaper than everybody else because he can, because he's getting it cheaper. Mm -hmm. And while that is good for the consumer in terms of price, um, it does a disservice because they can't get it when they need to get it from anybody else they, because nobody else wants to sell it because they can't make any money. So we're trying to open up new distribution and we couldn't do it because they didn't see any profit in it. So, so, you know, it was tough. So it, it was a tough decision to make, but uh, I, I think it was the right decision. And now we're in year six okay. of this policy and uh, we're approached all the times from other manufacturers. Some of these like industry leaders saying, hey, how did you do this? Because <laughs> because we've been really successful and, and I think we're kind of the, like the poster child for having a successful policy. Yeah, bringing some value back to the brand rather than just essentially whoring it out on, on Amazon, right? <laughs> right, right. Okay, so 
I mean, you, you just touched on it, is that it's it has worked out for you. Um, I mean, is it, so it's easier for you to now sell your product to dealers and, and wholesalers because people can actually make a margin on it, then, right? Uh, yeah, it's, well, I'd say yes and no. Um, you know, setting setting good standards always always helps to sell a product, whether it's in the quality or it's in the pricing or it's in service. But it still requires a lot of effort on our part, you know, to, to maintain that, you okay. know, to respect our policy requires us to enforce that policy and make, and, and it's had a, uh, it's forced us to place some of our biggest customers on the, on our do not sell list. And, and that's hard. Yeah. You know, so, so when you say, is it easier? Well, <laughs> it's not always easier. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I think it, it, it it, it makes it a lot easier for the shops to go out and sell it because now they they know what to expect and they know what they need to sell it at. Mm -hmm. And do you does ACT or yourself uh, reach out to the the I guess the end installer level and ask if it's if it's been working for them? Like like are you still hands on and engaging these shops that are installing your product and see if it's if it's been successful for them too? Sure. Sure. Yeah. And actually we've, uh, on any of our new products, we actually install it. We, we will install here at the shop, make sure we've, we've done the, the install. We know what it's like. We've actually started doing videos on, uh, showing what the install is step-by-step. Step. It's not a, not, it's not so much a, a, um, a product promotion video. It's, it's more how to, how to install it. We want, you know, we want to educate the customer and, and be a service to the, to the uh, the person installing it, mm -hmm. uh, but it gives us that uh, that hands-on experience with the car. Um, gotcha. Yeah, and it's I mean that's no different than literally every OE part ever made has a manual for it. So, <laughs> well, why not make any aftermarket parts have the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, but but now uh, you know nobody wants to read anymore. <laughs> yeah, they want right. to. Yeah, just show me how. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we can say yeah, this bolt right here, you know, or whatever, and. Uh, and yeah, we've been been uh, really building up that library of install videos, and and we're going to do more and more videos going forward. Okay. And a, a specific product that uh, has a, I I felt has been a real game changer um, over the last couple of years uh, has been your monolock. And so you guys uh, designed it and patented it, which is, I guess, pretty rare for the imports part stuff to patent things. But I guess it has enough applications that it was worth doing for you. But uh. You know, like you guys really found a problem with the, the factory uh, retainer rings popping off cars and then basically having customers having to spend $900 in labor to replace what I thought was maybe a $10 part. And, uh, you know, you guys made a product that even if it did pop off, you could fix it without having to take the transmission back out. Um, and I have not ever had one pop out. I've had some of them a little difficult to get off when you're taking cars apart, but... I mean, that's not, a, that's not a bit as bad as having to take it out because it fell apart. Um, but kind of walk us through developing a product like this, you know, like you guys identified a product or a problem, right? And you looked for a solution and you, and you patented it. This is kind of like the ideal way to do this, right? Uh, yeah. And, and thanks for the props on the product. Um, we've had, uh, we had a few problems that needed a solution all at the same time. First and foremost, was the fact that we saw failures of the Exidy design on on the Evo. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same design used on other ones, but the Evo really had more problems with with the ring popping off of of the standard uh, wedge collar and stuff. But on top of that, Exidy wouldn't wouldn't sell these wouldn't sell the wedge collar separately, and they had a patent on it. Okay. So <laughs> so you could you couldn't reproduce it even if you wanted to, and the and then, of course, you know, XC stopped selling to ACT. <laughs> so, uh, so really, f for me, I, I took a couple hours. I remember doing this, and, you know, and, and just setting aside a couple hours to just think through this. How how do we fix this? And you know, because I'm busy, I'm a busy guy, and I think, yeah, we got to do this, we got to do this. But I I intentionally just stopped and let my let my mind wander and and ponder different things. And uh, I sent and I and I pondered. You know what? What it would take to fix this, and I thought through the the whole process. You know, the all the way from the problem to to the design to how you manufacture it, 
is there any way to shortcut it? Um, the material, the heat treat, everything all at one time, which, uh -huh. which is great. I, that seldom happens, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and I, and considering the cost and would it be worth it, you know, but so anyway, that, that's how that started. Um, then I had to make, make some and try it out, you know, but, but I wanted to, I wanted to patent the monologue mainly to thwart any efforts to show we were violating Exidy's patent. Okay. Uh, it's not not like I was too worried about somebody copying copying it, uh, honestly, because uh, these things are a pain in the butt to make. You know, they they can get expensive really quickly, and the tolerances, the processes, the heat treatment all have to be right to make to make that product work, to make a monolock uh, work right. You know, so I, I'm not too worried about copying it, but I but I did the patent because I wanted to to show that hey, we've done our due diligence. That yes, this is a different part. And I don't know if I would have patented it. I, I mean, going back, I don't know if I would have done it again because I had a tough time with the patent process. It cost about three times what I thought it should have and what we were told it would cost. Yeah, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. have, have you had anybody try to copy it? Not that I'm aware of. No, I've seen, I've seen other designs. Yeah, me too. Uh, but Not the, nearly as nice, though. <laughs> but the, I mean, the, the key to this is just that it's one piece. Yep. I think that's what makes it work. Having a separate ring that can become dislodged, that that's where the main problem was. Mm -hmm. And having having one piece then then uh, you know that uh, that fixed that. Yep. And and it's not what's what's amazing to me is um the part is not a cheap part. I mean, you sell it separately, which is cool cuz you can put it on your competitors clutches. So like a twin disc Exidy. And we sell quite a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know like th what's amazing to me is even at that price point for that part, I don't ever have a problem selling them to customers because I can just tell them like, if that ring pops off, it's nine hundred dollars to take the transmission back out and fix it. You know, like this this seventy five dollar part here can fix that problem, and you never have to worry about it. And I've never had anybody say no. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, when you when you consider how much work it is, yeah, it, it's it's a bargain, but. Uh, it's not that expensive because uh, we're making a ton of money on it. It's, I mean, you, you look at that piece, and we, we're starting off with, you know, a big chunk of metal and whittling all that away. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, like the the factory part, you know, it's, it's a stamping. Stamp. Yeah. It's cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't stamp this. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I would. I, you know, this is not something we need to do on the podcast, but I'd love to see how it's actually made. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, so moving on here, what's something you guys do differently that kind of makes yourself makes makes yourself successful that others might not have thought about? I don't know. Uh, I've been really fortunate. Yes, I, I I don't know how much credit I can take in this. Uh, yeah, I guess I don't take shortcuts. We don't take shortcuts. I, I want to dot the i's, cross the t's. You know, I, I don't avoid paying taxes or, or that. And I try not to avoid that uncomfortable phone call, like, you know, calling you saying, Hey, you can yell at me. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You treat, treat people right. Uh, even when it costs you something, that's okay. It's, it's business. That's, that's part of doing business. It's going to cost, you know, I'm, but I'm always looking for a better design, uh, improved methods of manufacturing, a new challenge, you know, and I think that's, that's really, uh, has led to our success is, is just, you know, look, looking at everything is a challenge. Hey, how can you make it better? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So let's, let's continue on here. Um, what's something that you struggle with business and how do you deal with it? Hmm. Well, by nature, by nature, I'm, I'm shy, you know, and I, and I'm a perfectionist, you know, so I have to kind of overcome that, that shyness. You know, I want to be in the back doing something. I don't want to be out front. <laughs> But uh, but as a business owner, you you have to be. You want you have to lead, and uh, and and so I, I struggle with with getting out front. Okay. But but that's okay. I, I work through that. But I'm a, I'm a perfectionist, so I I don't want to make mistakes. I always worry about making mistakes, and that and that slows me down sometimes. And it slows the business down. Trying to trying yeah, to reach I've, that one hundred percent of a product rather than settling for ninety seven percent. That kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's the product or it's it's anything really, okay. you know, and that and that has has slowed me down. I think uh, so. I, I sh I've struggled with that. Uh, I've learned to to get over it and 
<laughs> and you know, take or at least recognize it, right? right. <laughs> First step is realizing you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but go ahead and take that risk. You know, um, like I said before, you know, failure is not the enemy. <laughs> so, and do you have a one-year plan for yourself in the business? Not, not a formal plan. Okay. Uh, yes, we do. We've, we've set goals. Uh, we have budget goals. We have uh, growth goals and things like that. We sit down as a management team and we plan that. Um, but uh, our one-year plan is to get some of the projects we've been planning over the last five years out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's always the case. You know, This year, we'd like to uh, reinvest in, in either some new equipment or renegotiate with the owners to purchase the building. That would be fantastic. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of things we want to accomplish, but there's so many things always in the hopper, you know, and, and some of those will, will trickle up and some of them, you know, we're going to put off, you know, because of whatever that, that roadblock is, but we'll just keep pushing. Okay. And then I'm guessing if you guys really planned out for five years, is that something that you've thought about that far out? <laughs> um, we've, we've thought about it. I can't say we have a five-year plan. Uh, per se, because in five years, I'd like to expand, expand into other technologies and products. Okay. Uh, although there's there's room to expand in clutches, you know, clutches are not exactly a growing segment of the industry. Yeah, electric cars are going to are gonna make that worse too, huh? <laughs> yeah, you got it. So, that, yeah, so we the, the plan is to expand into other things. Okay. Uh, and, and we really haven't laid out what that is yet. Okay, so diversifying your portfolio a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whether that's, uh, I don't know. We may purchase another business. We may. Uh, if, I, I don't know. I'm. I've never bought somebody else's business before, but uh, the chances are we'll, you know, we'll just find find another mousetrap to make, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and we like to take action on do it for a living. Can you suggest an action item our listeners can take away to improve their situation? Well, what's helped me out is to just allow myself time to, to ponder. It's like that two hours for the monologue, you know, st stop to, to pray. Really. I, I'm, I'm a guy of faith, you know, so I, I but I, I don't do it enough, but you know, <laughs> where you stop and pray and then listen. And, uh, yeah, I find direction comes a lot more clear when I stop long enough in my busy life to actually, uh, take the time and listen mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to take action on it. Very cool. Yeah, and I think you're you're spot on. As most people don't spend enough time to kind of, I guess, uh, reflect on what they're doing and think about what to do moving forward either. You know, it's just kind of go, 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 and there's no uh, there's no pausing. <laughs> Becomes a right. problem. Yeah, and I I can do busy. That's uh, I I suffer from that. <laughs> I have that illness. Okay, and moving on to our quick answer questions, these are just kind of think of whatever comes to mind. You don't have to expand on it at all. So what's a game-changing product you've seen in the last year? Um, I mean, game-changing for our industry would probably be the self-driving cars, the electric cars, because it's going to totally, like you said, it's clutches are not are not going to be used on those at all. Um, but I don't know how that how that translates into uh, in a product and in performance a performance either. product yeah. yeah exactly and what uh, software programs are you guys using daily uh, for our accounting manufacturing we're using uh, a sage 100 okay um, we use office 365 for the normal stuff and of course SolidWorks for for our Design. engineering okay um, most of the calculations and for our diaphragm springs and stuff are actually done in Excel we've had uh, our engineers make up their own uh, spreadsheets uh, <laughs> way of doing the calculations and stuff. Very cool. Um, although the engineering department does use SolidWorks, I, ha I haven't taken the time to, to the opportunity to learn it, uh, which I probably should. But <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of those things that is like, it's fun to do, but you know, like how useful are you if you start, you know, you like, that's what I've always thought to myself. I'd like to do it, but yeah. I don't think I'd ever be useful knowing it. <laughs> so Yeah, I've got guys that are really proficient. And for me to, to dabble in it, you know, I, I just, I don't know if it's worth my time. Okay. Uh, that's, that's a hard thing. What about phone apps? Are you a smartphone guy? A little bit, not, not too much. Um, you know, I, I have a, a Bible app that every morning I listen to uh, a portion of, of 
of scripture to start my day. Okay. Yeah, it just kind of helps me prepare as I'm making my coffee and whatnot. It's pretty routine. Okay. You know, um, at work it's pretty basic. Yeah, a lot of email and just the the normal stuff. Um, it's consumed with uh, my day is consumed with fire suppression. It seems all right. <laughs> you know? uh, but but that fits me because I you know I like to be the problem solver. Okay. You know, so some sometimes it's great and sometimes it's not so great. You know, because I I get so so busy. But but uh, you know to like I said, trying to find that time to to ponder and all that. I don't get enough of that. Okay. And especially with the last few years with stuff going on with Kennedy, yeah, you know, my time is just distributed over all these different things and you know okay. but uh but yeah in terms of sorry back to back to the favorite app yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't know i think my favorite app is probably that one that that identifies the phone call that's coming in and says nope i don't want that one <laughs> call <or> ID, right? <laughs> that's <All> right. it <laughs> perfect okay and what's your favorite shop tool you said oh, you like by... to work on stuff and you're a tinkering guy so oh my gosh by uh Definitely the manual engine lathe. Uh, whether I'm whittling out a custom flywheel or making some new tooling or what, I can make chips like nobody's business. Okay. And the guys in the back go, "Wow!" Because you know, I don't get down there a lot, you know. But but if I'm on the lathe and I'm and I'm making stuff, I'm not afraid to to hog into it. Okay. And uh, I've I've done that for years, so I'm I'm pretty good. That I'm good at. Very cool. And what kind of car are you driving now? Uh, right now, I've got a 2015 uh, Jeep Wrangler Rubicon. Okay. Uh, the four door. And you said you uh, off road it. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it's got battle scars. It's got lot, lots of rock rash underneath. But I've only started. I I got it what, in last June. So uh, so I we did a bunch of work to it. You know, it's nothing too off the off the hook. You know, but but it's got you know. Uh, it's got a lift and and all the protection, the bumpers and the rock guards and everything else, you know, winch. And uh, I bought it uh, with the excuse that we need to design a new clutch, which we did. <laughs> you know, we prototyped it on there, but uh, but really, it's it's to have fun. Okay. You know, we we had a Jeep before that. Or actually, I still have a an old TJ. And so I started getting into it because I I've been a dirt bike guy for years, and I go out riding with the kids, and the wife would stay home. Well. When she she saw the the jeeps and we went to a couple events, she said, "Hey, I I could do this with you." So, so it's something my wife and I can do together: go off roading and join a local club and stuff. Very cool. Yeah, I, I'm kind of jealous. I really want to try some of that stuff. <laughs> uh, the race the blast. race car stuff it it I, it's so expensive that I can't afford to do it myself. So I can only do it vicariously through customers. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's very expensive. Yeah, Jeeps aren't too bad, you know, but they're, they say uh, Jeep's an acronym for just empty every pocket. Okay, so it's the same problem then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you're telling me this now, yet I'll ignore it and then move forward with, a, with an off-road vehicle of some type and then realize oh, yeah. that it's a you money sucker problem <laughs> too. <laughs> so what do you think the future of automotive performance is going to be? Well, I think it's going to be good. Um, there's always pe people that have a passion you know, for racing or for performance or doing something different with, with their car. Uh, but our industry is changing quite a bit and it's going to keep changing. You know, heck, you know, like I said, I, I make clutches that are probably not going to be, uh, there's not going to be a need for performance clutches in these self-driving electric cars. So I'm going to have to find something new, some other, you know, mousetrap to build. Uh, yeah, but that's, that's the challenge I enjoy. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I, I don't know what the performance automotive side is going to look like. You know, the the I'll say the aftermarket side. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm sure it's going to be alive and well. Okay. And how do we connect with you and your company? Uh, well, our website is advancedclutch.com. Uh, I can be emailed directly. And I don't mind that at all. It's dstarkson at advancedclutch.com. Awesome. And uh, Dirk, I really wanted to thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, share your story with us. Ah, you bet. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Do It For A Living. You can find out more about this guest, this show, and even details about what we just talked about at our website. Check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash do it for a living and tell us who you want to hear from. And most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Click subscribe. Do it now. 
Seriously. I'll wait while you grab your phone. Open up the podcast app. Tap the subscribe button. When you subscribe, you help us gain momentum and attract more high-level guests.